Elizabeth, a literary princess. If you are new here, welcome. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in English literature with a focus on Victorian women novelists. And as you might expect, I love to read and I love sharing what I'm reading and hearing about what other people are reading, hence the booktube channel. Today I have another installment of my What Did I Read in My PhD for English Literature series. We are in spring of 2021. So this is the second semester of my second year. And this is the second course that we are talking about. We um, talked last time about my 19th century American course, which I also took in spring of 2021. And this course is actually my independent study on Victorian women novelists. So I obviously, as you can probably have, have seen if you've watched the rest of these videos, well, I did get to do a Victorian class and I had my 19th century American class. I hadn't really gotten to focus on Victorian women novelists, which is what I do. And I really wanted a chance to do that. So I approached um, my Victorian Gothic professor who would later become my advisor. And I asked if I could do an independent study with him and he agreed. And this is the syllabus we kind of came up with. What I really wanted to do here was a few things. I wanted to look at how female authors portray female characters. I wanted to look at the different genres that women writers worked within. And I wanted to both find some authors that are kind of forgotten and that I was unfamiliar with, while also revisiting a few who I was familiar with, but maybe some of the works that I hadn't read yet, or if those were, authors were a bit lesser known and were doing something within the idea of portraying women and working within different genres. So there was kind of a lot going on here. Um, what we did was we read generally a novel a week. Sometimes there were two novels a week. There was one week, we'll get to it, but I'm like, girl, what were you <laughs> crazy? What were you doing? And we also each picked a secondary source that we wanted to look at and we would send it to each other. So this was a really fun course for me because of course it's my stuff. <laughs> and it was really fun for my professor because he wasn't overly familiar with a lot of these works. So we were kind of discovering it together and that was a lot of fun. This of course put me on the road to my dissertation. Like almost all of my dissertation authors are in here. So let's jump in. So we actually started off, um, my professor said we need to begin with George Eliot because she is kind of the woman writer of the period. I had only read a few of her novels, so, and I had a very mixed, <laughs> mixed experience with them. So my professor was like, let's do Romola for a few reasons. First of all, he really likes it where he, as he doesn't really like Middlemarch. And second, he thought that I would really like it. And he was completely correct. <laughs> um, I've actually now read this twice. So I read it for my independent study, which was the first time I read it, really enjoyed it. I gave it four stars. And then I just reread it for the George Eliot project and it bumped up to four and a half stars. This is a piece of historical fiction set in Fifteenth century Florence, I think, and it is following several characters, but it kind of all centers around a young woman named Romola, who is the daughter of this elderly scholar, and her marriage to this guy named Tito, who is a Greek man who has kind of been basically shipwrecked. There's a lot of political stuff going on. This is kind of during the fall of the Medici family and the rise, and there's also religious things going on. This is the rise of Savonarola. So that is all intertwined. All this real political and religious stuff is intertwined with um, the fictional story of a woman. 
character. And also Tito, who Tito sucks. If you want more on my thoughts on Romola, you can go watch my video on it. I will link it. Um, it does have spoilers, so. But yes, I really enjoyed this. And I was so glad to find a George Eliot book that I had loved because the only one I had loved was The Mill on the Floss. And I had read two of her other ones that, nope, had not been for me. So this kind of rekindled my thoughts of like, okay, I might actually like George Eliot. And now we're here doing the George Eliot project. So, but George Eliot, like, like my professor said, she kind of was the woman writer who everybody was compared to. So it was important to start our independent study with her. That same week, we also looked at George Eliot's essay, Silly Novels by Lady Novelists, in which she <laughs> heavily criticizes, first of all, a lot of women writers who are writing books that she feels are silly, and also the way that critics respond to those women writers by just kind of flattering them. But then when a great woman writer comes up like Charlotte Bronte, they're more, they're harder on that, on like a truly good woman writer than on these silly novelists who just are writing ridiculous stuff for fun, basically. This um, ended up being a pretty important work for my final paper and honestly probably for my dissertation too. It's it's the thing that everybody always goes to when you're talking about women writers in the Victorian period. You're going to be talking about silly novels by lady novelists. So again, very important to read. The next week we read two novels and this is why I'm like, girl, you are crazy. And I was like actually managing this. I don't know how. I don't know how. But this week we were looking at Margaret Oliphant. So we looked at Miss Marchbanks, which you've all heard me talk about Miss Marchbanks. If you've been here for any length of time, I adore this book. <laughs> I adore this book <laughs> so much. This follows Lucilla Marchbanks as she comes home from school to kind of run the household of her father. And she decides she is going to elevate the society in her town of Carlingford. So she's, she's Emma Woodhouse if Emma Woodhouse were actually good at doing anything. So where Emma Woodhouse house just fails in everything, Lucilla Marchbanks is incredibly successful. I adore this book. I think I gave it, I think I only gave it four stars, but that was before I was doing half readings. So it would probably be more like four and a half. Honestly, I think it might be five. I don't, I don't know what, what second year Elizabeth was, was doing, but I loved this and I did end up writing my final paper about it. So we will, we will talk more about it in a little bit. And then we also looked at Hester which is again about a young woman named Hester who encounters her older female relative Catherine Vernon who is a single woman who runs her family's bank because the men are all useless essentially. So this is very involved with like money and women being involved in like this kind of public sphere there's also like a question of will Hester marry or not. And this was just great. <laughs> this was such a good book too. I really enjoyed this one as well. I love Margaret Oliphant. You all know that already. <laughs> I think I only gave this one four stars too. Why? I feel like it, I don't know what second year Elizabeth was doing. Okay, anyway. So what we were really talking about it with Oliphant was the idea of the realist novel, which both of these definitely are, and kind of women authors place it within the realist genre and women characters within realist novels. So yeah, this was my favorite week. <laughs> I'm over here reading two like 400 something page books and I'm like, this was my favorite week. Anyway, next up we looked at 
Elizabeth Gaskell's Wives and Daughters. So Elizabeth Gaskell is another one of the really big women writers of that period who's definitely within the literary canon. But I wanted to look at two of what I felt like were her kind of, they're not lesser known, but I think they're not taught as much as Mary Barton and North and South. So this is the first one. We'll get to the other one in a little bit. Wives and Daughters, again, we were discussing realist fiction because this is very much a realist novel. This tells the story of Molly Gibson, whose father is widowed, and he then remarries, and Molly has a new stepsister named Cynthia. And again, it's like a very, we're in this town, we have all these people, they're on, it's mostly focused on like the relationships between people. This I gave four stars. It's definitely not my favorite Gaskell. It's also, it's really long. So to read all of this in a week, I mean, this copy, which given is a mass market paperback, so it's really large, but it's 900 pages. <laughs> Um, it's also unfinished. Um, Elizabeth Gaskell died before she could finish this. So it ends really abruptly. And you, you can tell what the ending was gonna be, but to not have it is a little bit unsatisfying. <laughs> but I did really enjoy this one. This was also four stars. And continuing with the realist novel, we looked at one that I had already read and really loved, but that my professor had not heard of, or he'd heard of it, but he hadn't read it before. This is The Tend of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. This deals with a woman named Helen Graham, who is the tenant of Wildfell Hall of the title. She has just moved to this town and lives in this kind of falling apart house alone with her son. And people are gossiping about her. And eventually Gilbert Mark Markham, yep, who has like falling in love with her, she gives him her diary so that he can read her story. And it turns out Helen Graham is not her real name. Her name is Helen Hunting Huntington. It's not gonna tell me on the back. And this is the story of the breakdown of her marriage. So, spoiler. I, ugh, classics are hard to talk about without spoilers. Sorry. So this was very interesting because it has a woman leaving her husband in a time when that was just not done at all. And that was what I really wanted to look at here with this book. So this is one of my favorite books ever, period. It's five stars. It was five stars the first time I read it. It was five stars this time. Five stars all around. I love this book. So for the next week, we started moving more into this idea of specific genres other than realist novels. And this was another week we did two books. And for this, we focused on the governess novel, which of course brought us <laughs> once again to Anne Bronte with her Agnes Grey. This was another one that I had read before, but that I felt was kind of important. If we're going to be talking about the governess novel, this is very much like the realist governess novel you can find because it is a very realistic depiction of life of a Victorian governess. Anne Bronte pretty much just lifted her experiences and put them in here. Uh, this is, I think this is a four star for me, if I remember correctly. It might be more like a 4.5, but it's not my favorite Bronte book, although I do really like the love interest in this one. I think he is the only decent man in the entire, like, Bronte body of work. Only decent guy. <laughs> This is the story of the title character, Agnes Grey, who becomes a governess to help her financially struggling family. And she is not very good at it. And like some of it is just that the kids are terrible and the families don't discipline them and won't allow her to discipline them. But also she's just not really qualified <laughs> at all. <laughs> so we talked a lot about that. 
For this week, we also read another governess novel. This is Bread Upon the Waters, A Governess's Life by Dinah Mullet Crake. So this was my first book by Crake. And there's actually another one by her in this in this syllabus that we'll talk about. Um, I hated this book. This was a one star book for me. One star. <laughs> I don't rate many books one star, especially Victorian books. I'm always very willing to be like, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. No, no, this was that bad. This is the story of, I don't even remember her name. But it was written for like the governess society or something. And I hate it's these stupid print for print on demand copies that give me no no information about the book. So like I can't even find the main character's name. But her father remarries and the new wife hates her and her brother and basically kicks them out of the house. So the girl becomes a governess to support her brother. And <sighs> this book's treatment of disability is really bad, which is strange because usually Crake handles disability pretty well, at least in other books, the other book I have read by her and in other books I have heard of, it's really bad. This is just really bad. I don't recommend it. I hated this so much. So much. From here, we moved into two weeks of talking about sensation fiction. And the first one that we read was Mary Elizabeth Braddon's Lady Audley's Secret, which is an amazing book and you should all go read it. Um, this follows the newly married Lucy Audley who has risen up from governess to lady. And there's some sketchy stuff going on. So her <sighs> cousin-in-law, I think it's like, or nephew-in-law. <laughs> it's like the nephew of her husband starts investigating and unravels Lady Audley's secret. This is such a good book. I had so much fun with this one, as did my professor. And I've, I have talked about it on here before. Um, it's, uh, Braddon is definitely gonna be in my dissertation. I don't know if Lady Audley specifically will make it in, but this is just such a good book. Very twisty and turny, great mystery. Don't read the back of the book, it'll spoil it. <laughs> Actually, it does, this one doesn't spoil it too much, but, but generally speaking, don't read the backs of the books. It'll spoil it completely. But yes, I love this book. I'm pretty sure, again, I only gave it four stars when it should be more like a four and a half or even a five. I need to reread it. Clearly, I don't, again, I don't know what second year Elizabeth was doing. To be fair, I was reading most of these in a week. In our second week of sensation fiction, we looked at East Lynn by Ellen Wood. So this is a complicated book to talk about because the back gives away the whole book. <laughs> and basically everything that I read about it ahead of time gave away the entire plot, like with stuff that doesn't even happen until more than halfway through, just being talked about as if that was the full story. And I find that really ruins things. But this is the story of Lady Isabel, who marries a guy whose name isn't in my head anymore. And mainly because of her husband's own stupidity, she falls prey to a guy who seduces her. And then this is the consequences of that. And the consequences are crazy. There is hidden identities, there's a train crash, there's insanity. <laughs> there's death, it's, it's insanity. I gave this one three stars. I think that if I had not been entirely spoiled by the back of the book, I might have liked it better because 
I think not getting to discover all the twists kind of ruins it. I also think um, if Ellen Wood had just structured it differently, it would have been a better book. It is a really interesting one, though, and I do want to go back to it because I feel like I should like it more than I did. And that maybe now knowing everything, I'm like, okay, I can be prepared and go in. And it also has two of my least favorite characters in Victorian literature. Um, Lady Isabel's husband is a moron. And then Barbara Hare. I hate Barbara Hare. Um, and I have a whole video on my least favorite characters in Victorian fiction. And you can listen to me rant about Barbara Hare if you want. But she sucks. <laughs> So I gave this three stars. It was definitely, I'm glad I read it. I need to reread it. And from there, we wanted to look at the fallen woman because East Lynn deals with that as well. So we turned back to Elizabeth Gaskell with her book, Ruth, which is the story of Ruth, <laughs> who gets seduced by an upper class man. She is a working class girl and the consequences of it. I liked this book. I gave it four stars. It was a pretty controversial book at its time. It like caused a bit of a sensation. And yeah, I think it's definitely worth the read. Again, it's not my favorite Gaskell book, but I do think it's it's a good book and it's worth reading. And it is a pretty sympathetic portrayal of the fallen woman, whereas some are less so. <laughs> it's very sympathetic to Ruth. So that's nice to see instead of her just being condemned as a lot of Victorian people and authors did. So from here we kind of just moved back into realist fiction for a quick moment. I'm looking at this syllabus and sometimes I'm like I don't understand the order of things which is weird because you know I made the order of things for this entire thing. He was like yeah you figure it out. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So we did another Dinah Mullet Crake book. This is Olive, another stupid print on demand edition. This tells the story of a girl named Olive who has a spinal curvature. And because of this, it is considered she will never get married or have a normal life because of her disability. So she becomes an artist. This is sometimes seen as a response to Jane Eyre, which is part of why I was super interested in it. Also, working woman and character with a disability in Victorian literature just sounded really interesting. And I did like it. I can't remember if this was three or four for me. I, th I think it might have been more like a three and a half. But again, I didn't do half star ratings at this point. And it's one that I definitely want to reread. So in that week, we also did a little bit of looking at Craig's nonfiction, um, A Woman's Thoughts About Women, I think it was called and I'll put it up here. And it was just Craig kind of talking about what she felt was the place of women in British society at the time. I don't remember much of it other than that. Next, we looked at Ouida and her book Moths. So this, I don't even know how to describe what this is. <laughs> this is published in 1880. So these last two weeks were like the the end of the century. We have a book from 1880 and I think a book from 1890 something. And this is, what is this? What is this? I don't know, but I love it. This is the story of, God, what is her name? Veer, who goes to join her mother, Lady Dolly in Europe. And Lady Dolly is the vainest, most worldly, selfish woman you can imagine. All she cares about is money, status, and having affairs. <laughs> and she wants to marry her daughter off well. And she marries her to a Russian prince that Veer absolutely detests. She is literally basically blackmailed into marrying this man. When in reality, she is in love with this opera singer. It's very melodramatic. It's... 
I don't know. It's just fun. It's high society being awful and then like also this super melodramatic romantic stuff going on with Vera and her opera singer. And I was here for it. I gave this four stars. Again, it's probably more like a four and a half. And this is another one that I talked about in my final paper. So we will talk a little bit more about it then. And the last book that we read was Heavenly Twins by Sarah Grand. This is a new woman novel. And we follow kind of three women, I suppose. We've got Avadne, who marries a guy who she doesn't know very well and then very quickly realizes her mistake and refuses to truly live as a married couple. We have Angelica, who is one of the heavenly twins of the title and kind of her struggle with a woman's place in the world, especially when compared with her brother. There's this great scene where she, or part where she cross dresses as her brother. It's, it's something else. And then we have, I think, Edith. Is her name not on the back? That's so mean. But Edith also marries a guy that she doesn't know very well to very bad consequences. So Sarah Grand tackles a lot here. She tackles the place of women in society. She tackles the issue of men bringing sexually transmitted diseases to their wives who are completely ignorant of these things because of the way society treats women and educates them. And yeah, <laughs> there's a lot going on. It's a very big book. I read this in a week. I think I read it in four days, actually, because I used to, um, I used to like put it into four parts and I'd read one part each day. That was for all of these. That's how I read all of them. <laughs> yeah, this is a difficult book to, t to talk about. Um, I think I've talked about this as well in my underrated Victorian literature recommendations. I liked parts of it. Other parts of it got kind of dull. I think I ultimately gave it three stars. It's very weird. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't feel quite cohesive. But I think what Grand is talking about is really important. I think she's got some great characters in here. And I think she does a better job in her third. This is one of three books in a trilogy. It's the second book, weirdly enough. You don't actually need to read them in order, though. But um, the next book, the Beth book, I think brings her points into a single story a lot better than the Heavenly Twins does. But the Heavenly Twins is the more well known of the three. So definitely glad that I read it, but not my favorite. We get to my final paper, which I titled Taking Silly Novels Seriously, Reframing Silliness as Intelligent Feminine Thought in Margaret Oliphant's Miss March Banks and Weta's Moths. So I was obviously basing this somewhat in George Eliot's essay, Silly Novels by Lady Novelists, and also, but also how 20th and 21st century criticism still kind of views this women's books as silly. And I was trying to reframe that act, that silliness as this actually complex feminine specific course of thought involving domestic matters and social connections. So with Miss Marchbanks, Lucilla is completely concerned with her, her little social events and if everything is perfect for these social events and the music for it and what she's wearing and all these who's going to be there. Oh, we need to have a man who flirts and and it seems very silly. But in actuality, she is pulling all the strings in this town. She gets a man elected into Parliament. So and even even though we have that in this book, a lot of the criticism is kind of making fun of how silly Lucilla is. 
So I was seeing this as this feminine thought and how complex it is and it's not silly at all. It's just really quite complex navigating of social and domestic matters. And then in moths, we kind of see how a similar type of feminine thought as we see in Miss Marchbanks can be weaponized with Lady Dolly, who also has a lot of this kind of silliness to her, like she cares about fashion and what her rival is wearing and who she's socializing with and all of that. And it becomes really dangerous. It almost ruins, her, it does ruin her daughter's life. And we're seeing all, almost all of the women in this social set are exactly like that and how they're kind of pulling in their daughters to either become like them or using them to ruin their lives. So um, the opera singer that Vera is in love with uses this metaphor of the women are like moths. They are either trying to fly toward the light that will kill them or they are devouring the material and ruining stuff. So that was my argument there. I also wanted to, I also looked at the idea of melodrama being silly and how Wida reframes that silliness of melodrama as virtue because Vera and her opera singer, whose name I'm not, not remembering. <laughs> um, they are very melodramatic. Everything about them is steeped in melodrama, but they are the moral centers of the novel. They are li literally the only good characters and it's because they are melodramatic. Everybody else in the book is always being like, oh my God, why are they so melodramatic? There's one time when somebody actually wonders about Vera, where did she get her melodrama from? But it, we just showing it as this virtuous quality. So, yeah, so I'm basically arguing that these two books, silliness is actually a complex form of feminine thought that basically just can't be recognized within the male dominated lit sphere of literary criticism. And yeah, I was basically just arguing that women writers get dismissed for all this stuff and it's called silly whereas men because Charles Dickens was just as melodramatic as Weta <laughs> most of the time and he yet he's in the literary canon so it's specifically when women, when books deal with women's matters and are portraying female characters and are written by women and are appealing to women that they get labeled as silly when actually it's considerably more complex than that. So that is what I read for my independent study on Victorian women novelists. Technically that should have been where I ended coursework, but I did an extra year of coursework for my feminist studies certificate. So I'm going to be doing one more video in this series on my feminist theory class. And that's because we read as well as theory, we read literature. So I'm not going to be talking about my women, gender and health class because we read, didn't read a lot of full length books for that. So there will be one more video in this series. Let me know down in the comments below. Have you read any of these books? What did you think of them? Have you taken any courses on Victorian women novelists? What did you think of them? It has been great chatting with you. I will see you soon. Bye.